Today's class is the last class for engineering economics. Um, and then on Wednesday, there will in fact be no class because of the midterm, but I will be here to answer any questions just on an informal basis, sort of like a tutorial type session. But uh, I'm not going to have anything structured or prepared um, or anything. I'll just be available for questions that you come, come here with. Uh, so I will be here on Wednesday, but then in the evening we'll meet at 6.30 for the midterms. There's several midterm venues. I will post uh, your last name and the venue you are to go to. Uh, please do not show up at any of the random venues. Just uh, follow the instructions directly because the TAs will be checking and if you're not uh, assigned to that venue, you will be asked to go to the other venue, um, which might cause a delay in the timing for yourself. Okay, so it's two hours. There's no um, infinite time midterm. It's a fixed two-hour midterm. And um, we'll, we'll start that just after 6.30 is the nominal starting time, but we'll wait for people to show up and then start formally um, just shortly after that. Any questions about the midterm? Okay, so the solution for assignment four will be posted tomorrow afternoon. Uh, oh, for capital costing? Yeah. Okay, for capital costing, no, there's too many of them to, to possibly bring. So where they'll be required, you'll be provided with them. But you are responsible for bringing all of CEPCI indexes with you, as stated on the website. So print out the CEPCIs. Um, print out all the Canada Revenue Agency classes. That was also stated on the, mid on the website. Um, so anything that you've printed out ordinarily for this course as you've Proceeded. Um, the only thing that I obviously don't require you to print out is the entire copy of Dr. Woods's textbook, which is hundreds of pages. Okay. Anything? Yeah, it's all on the one engineering economics page. Everything that says it's needed for tests or midterms says next to it. Print this to bring to midterms. Okay. So it's been st it's been up there for for several weeks now. Anything else? Yes, Shani. Okay, do you need to be able to calculate DCFRR by hand? No, that's a nonlinear iterative calculation, which would be really just wasteful of your time. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, perhaps take an unconventional start to this class today, and I want you to answer this. So discuss with the person next to you, what is your take on that question? Any groups want to volunteer some concepts around that? Mark? Um, possibilities of having a negative outcome or a loss. Okay, so uh, two interesting things there. Possibility of a loss. Okay, clear. Uncertainty in the in the market. Okay. So uncertainty in the market. 
Any other concepts around risk? How do you think, um, if you think back over the past four or five weeks of material we've covered, where has risk and uncertainty and shown up? Yeah. The MARR value? Anything else? Don't. Payback time has some uncertainty. Okay. Ema? The time value of money or the, the interest rate that you're using? Yeah. Anything else? What else? Other, look at back at an NPV analysis. What goes into it? And how certain do you, are you of those parameters and numbers in the NPV analysis? Cash flow, future cash flow, and the anticipated sales. OK. Anything else there that you? OK, so MARR is probably one of the least uncertain parameters. Or you go speak to your finance department, they give it to you. What, when you're setting up that spreadsheet, what are some of the questions going through your mind about re being realistic, uncertainty, using these w words that are up here? Possibilities, probabilities. Which numbers should give you the most concern? Projected revenues, okay, so sales. Yeah. The electrical expenses, other ongoing el el eligible expenses, okay, I see, yeah. The duration of the project, capital N that you're using for the NPV. What the actual inflation rate or time value of money may be. What the Okay, so the time value of money, but we're, we're wrapping that up into MARR, which we're going to be assumed is pr pretty stable, but there might be some uncertainty in MARR. For, for example, is the tax rate or depreciation rate going to change? Not too likely, right? Um, the depreciation rate of 30% has been that for many, many years and unlikely to change to 33, 35%, okay? What about the capital cost estimates? They're some of the largest uncertainties we've seen. In the past few days, we've, we've certainly seen when we're estimating these capital costs, numbers of plus and minus 40% on the things that have definitely got the largest dollar value in your plant. Okay. So did you want to add something? I was just going to say that. that. Okay, yeah. So risk. Risk is what we're, what we're talking about in today's class, uncertainty, probability of events occurring. And I'll argue that if you use the techniques that we learn about in today's class, you'll probably never make a financial blunder in your life. Okay? So people that experience the issues around the, the mortgage market, the subprime mortgage market, 2008, 2009, I guess maybe you guys weren't paying attention to what was going on uh, being in high school, but really what one of the main triggers there were people were being sold mortgages, so they're paying back two, three hundred thousand dollars on houses in a mortgage, so a monthly payment, and then when the mortgage comes up for renewal at five years, suddenly the rate isn't two, three percent anymore. That two, three percent interest rate that they were promised which was true for five years, now suddenly became a much higher number. And their monthly paycheck couldn't support the payback. Okay? So that uncertainty there in that interest rate was something that they didn't account for. They knew that they could pay back a mortgage at 3% interest, but when the mortgage rate now jumps to 5%, they can't make ends meet. If you had done even a basic sensitivity analysis on a spreadsheet, you could have realized that this is probably not a good financial situation to get yourself into, okay? And so you would have probably just stuck to renting rather than buying. So what, I'm, what we're going to see here today's class are techniques that you can use in your own life to avoid problems. And we're going to identify parameters that we're most sensitive to and what do we do about them and parameters we're least sensitive to and how we interpret that. So, so let's take a look at... Um, at some of the, the variable, 
or what we'll call parameters in an NPV. Okay, so for your project reports that you'll be working on, you'll be considering things like raw material costs, utility costs. Okay, so those el eligible expenses, uh, catalyst costs. Salaries. I'll, talk, I'll give you an example of how salaries might be variable um, in the future. The duration, as Kalia mentioned, of a project, so that capital N that you use in the NPV analysis. If your plant lasts a longer time or a shorter time, that can substantially affect the economics. The selling price was mentioned several times. So what is the market going to be willing to pay for your product? The tax rate, I would put here, is almost constant, right? And you really shouldn't be doing too much of a sensitivity analysis on that. Okay. Same for MARR. Unless you're in an environment where that is definitely varying. Okay. And there might be a few other things. There might be license fees that show up over here. Um, a new policy that comes in. The government might institute a new policy regarding pollution or carbon capture. Right? So then your, your costs of production are going to go up. If you now suddenly have to pay a carbon tax that you've never had to pay before, right? It's no different to that subprime mortgage market that I mentioned just a while ago back in 2008 when people come and renew their mortgages and realize that the generous introductory interest rates that they were given doesn't exist anymore. They now have to pay a much higher price, right? So if the government legislates some new changes in that's going to affect your business, that might put you out of business. Okay, so what we want to do is we don't want to decide to build a plant or a process or an addition to our plant that is so tenuous that it relies on so many of these numbers being accurate. So what we want to do is essentially figure out what parameters over there is our process or our system most sensitive to. And so the topic of today's class then is really what we just call sensitivity analysis. Now it has another name and I'll, uh, I'll use that name in a minute for those of you that are in the business area, you'll recognize that. But let's just use this topic for now, uh, this name for now. And the way you do the sensitivity analysis is all on a spreadsheet. Now I'm not going to show that part to you because it's it's very simple. You'll see how um, you, you could do it quite straightforwardly. But let's just show how you will present the results and how you interpret the analysis of it. So let's investigate one parameter. And I'm going to start here with the selling price. I'm going to take that one and show you how we might do a sensitivity analysis for that single parameter. And sales price might be in um, whatever units that you're working with. Let's take an example from assignment three when you were looking at that uh, factory in Tianjin in China. The sales price was there in dollars per kilogram. And if you recall from that assignment, um, and you can certainly see the solutions there online, when you go and do the NPV analysis, you can get an NPV plotted here on the vertical axis, an NPV equal to zero when your selling price is about $33. So give or take a couple of cents. 
when your selling price was $33 a kilo, your NPV was zero. Now, what happens when you choose to keep everything else in that NPV spreadsheet the same? You don't go touch the tax rate. You don't go touch any of the other numbers. And the only number you change is the sales price, and you go make that $37. NPV goes up. Okay, so if we went to 37, NPV might be over here now. Okay, so initially we were exactly at zero, and now at $37, NPV goes up. So you do that in the spreadsheet. I don't need to demonstrate that to you. You're, you know exactly how that's done. And if you go to $41, or what we're jumping here in steps of yeah, four, so let's go to $41, NPV will go up even further still. Right? So whatever number we get here, we plot that on our y-axis. So you just read it off your spreadsheet, and that's what you plot, plot it here on your y-axis. And the converse holds as well. If we dropped our selling price down to $29, we would get something over here. And if I dropped selling price even further still to 25, we would land up over there. Okay, so five simple scenarios in your spreadsheet just by changing a single parameter. And that's the key thing, changing only a single parameter sales price. So sales price down here, just to emphasize this terminology, is my parameter. Change only one parameter. Okay, and you can obviously draw a straight line through these And it usually is a straight line for moderate changes. But you can anticipate that if you sold your, your product for a low price, you might get a greater number of sales. And so it, it's a, it starts to work non-linearly. But for small changes around some base, it's typically a linear curve over there like that. Okay, let's go repeat that now. Um, I'd like to take a look at a different parameter this time. And let's uh, perhaps use the cost of our raw material. Okay, and in, the, in that uh, China case study, the, the raw material was extremely cheap. It was, remember, the reason why we were building this factory over there. Um, and the raw material price was, at our base case, was $100 per ton. So just to put that in perspective, that's um, 10 cents per kilo. Okay, so that gives you an idea here. If we're selling the product for $33 a kilogram and just breaking even, for our raw material, I'm only paying 10 cents a kilogram. And if you go look at that case study, when you go set your raw material at 10 cents, you might be getting an NPV, let's say, over here. So some value, some positive number, you're making a profit. Even at 10 cents per kilogram, you're making a profit. <clears throat> okay, now, in fairness, when we, when we generate these plots and include them in our reports, we should also list all the other variables we're keeping constant. It's really not fair for me just to only present raw materials over here. I should also have a list on the side that says some of my other base case assumptions. So for example, 
when I generate that number over here in the blue dot, my selling price might have been $45 per kilogram. So at a selling price of $45 per kilogram, I may also list all the other assumptions, so tax rates, capital cost amounts. So all other assumptions go here. All other values. And keeping those fixed, all those values fixed, when I sell, uh, sorry, when I buy my raw material and it costs me 10 cents a kilo or $100 a ton, I make a profit of that much. Now what's going to happen if my raw material costs me um, 20 cents a kilo? So my raw materials double. NPV is going to go up or down? Stay the same? Down, okay? We're, we're all in agreement that if my raw material goes up, my NPV goes down. And let's say I go to that $200 a ton. NPV goes down to there. Okay, and if my raw material went to 50 a ton, which is somewhere over here, my NPV would be a little higher, somewhere around there. Okay, and I can go do a few scenarios in between, four, five, or six, whatever it takes to get a trend. The key is you cover a range that is reasonable on that x-axis. So here the, the key point is this range must be realistic. Okay, and what we can see here is that my NPV is positive for all values of the raw material. So even extreme case of where my raw material halves in price or doubles in price, it really doesn't affect my NPV much. This is also a good piece of information to have. The moment you know that a parameter is not sensitive or is not causing a great deal of change in your NPV, that's a really good piece of information to have. It means that we can simply ignore that parameter going forward or not spend too much of our concern and energy about figuring out what it actually is. Okay? So this is nice to know when a parameter is not causing sensitivity to the NPV. Okay, and I can repeat this process. Let's, let's do it in a different color perhaps now. I could look at my utility costs. Now, utility costs are on a different scale, right? If I look at utility costs and perhaps I'm looking at natural gas, I'm looking at dollars per gigajoule. Well, how do I put utility costs on top of this figure? This figure is already in terms of um, dollars per ton of product. Right? But utilities are costed in terms of gigajoules. And I can do a bit of a conversion to find out what's, how many gigajoules go in each kilogram of product. And I can try and superimpose it on here. But you're starting to see how this is getting messy. Every single parameter that I have, and I've got quite a few of them potentially. I could have 10 or 20 of these parameters. Every single one I have to start generating a plot for. Okay, so what we try to do is, is reduce that. We want to visualize our results in maybe one or two plots rather than hundreds of them. And so what I can do is create what we call a spider plot. So let's see how that looks. So what we do on the spider plot is we plot over here on the horizontal axis percentage change. That's all we, we put. And it's percentage change of the parameter we're considering. 
so let's go back over here. What, le what we might start with is my selling price. My selling price has a certain base case, and at my base case, my percentage change is 0%. At my base case, when I sell my product, I might be making an NPV that sits over here. And if I increase my selling price by 10%, is the NPV going to go higher or lower? Higher. So if NPV goes up, uh, sorry, if my selling price goes up by 10%, my NPV is higher and it might be over here. And if my selling price goes up by 20%, it might be over here now. Okay, and you can see how this trend keeps going. And we can decrease my selling price. So what happens if I sell my product for lower than it costs? So it's a minus 10% change or a minus 20% change relative to the base case. So 0% is just my base case. And your base case is carefully documented. You document <laughs> what your base conditions are, and then you change up by certain amounts and figure out what that is on a percentage basis. So that's the first curve on my spider plot. And I'm going to note here that in purple, that that's my selling price. Now the next curve I might add to that is my utility costs. My utility costs at the base case is exactly the same point. Whatever this purple square is, my utility costs is also over here. The base case for that, let's use yellow triangles, is also that same NPV. Right? So go back to your spreadsheet, reset your selling price back to the base case, and now we're going to vary my next parameter, utility. <coughs> okay, and if I increase my utilities by 10, 10%, I'm going to get a drop. So I might go to that yellow triangle. If I increase my utilities by 20%, my NPV will drop further still. And so this varies in that way. So 10 quick simulations in your spreadsheet to generate this, this curve so far. So five simulations in purple, <coughs> varying selling price, and five simulations, one of which is actually the same over here at the, at the base case, to vary your utilities. So utility price. Okay, and the key is that my horizontal axis is percent change. Everyone clear on that, that curve? Any questions? OK, good. So we can keep going in that way, adding curves on. Let's perhaps investigate one more. Um, I'm going to show the effect of capital costs, perhaps. That might be my next concern, is capital costs. So at my base case, I'm going to use circles this time. For capital costs, I have a green circle. And if capital costs are estimated at my base case, but then for some unexpected reason, my capital, co capital costs are 10% higher than I had anticipated. So instead of a $1,000 pump, I'm paying 1100 for it. Everything on average goes up by 10%. 
it might be that for this particular project, the NPV drops quite substantially. And if, if capital costs had to go up by 20%, I would land up over here. If capital costs dropped by 10%, I would land up over there, and then 20% further still. Okay, so what we essentially get is a very steep curve this time for capital costs. Mark? Your base case is what you expect all of your values to be at? The base case is the most probable set of events that you're expecting for, right? So that's the case where you use your known raw material costs, your known selling price, this is what you really do expect in the future to happen. And the base case variation that we're showing here on the horizontal axis down and up is the percentage change relative to that base case. And so what this does, this plot, once you start adding four or five more curves on top of it, very effectively locates for you the parameters that you're most sensitive to and the parameters you're least sensitive to. Parameters that you're most sensitive to are those, for example, that are here in green, that the curve is extremely steep, right? So small changes in the capital cost here have a dramatic effect on your profitability. And that tells you immediately you have to get a better handle on that particular parameter, right? So it's not uncommon for capital costs to fluctuate by by this amount, by 20%. Right? This is fairly normal for capital costs to come in much higher than we anticipate. And so a project that shows negative revenue, so let's just emphasize here, I don't have the label, but NPV is what's showing on the vertical axis. So to have a negative NPV with only 20% increase in capital costs is already telling you there's a lot of risk here. So back to this idea of risk why I wanted you to think about that question at the start of the class. But this is all about evaluating risk. Now you can start to see how you can apply this to your personal life. Right? You know your NPV, you know your incomes, you know your expenses, or when you're working one day, you know your anticipated incomes, your anticipated expenses. A sensitivity analysis on the change in mortgage rates, right? is something that you can very easily calculate to see if you can still maintain monthly payments on your house, on your car, or cars, should interest rates go up by one, two, three, four percent. Okay, so again, choose a range here that's realistic. And we know that from historical data what typical values are. Right? And you can quickly see, are you still able to make monthly payments on your house and your car should interest rates go up? So you can avoid that sort of catastrophic behavior of having to move out of your house or have your car repossessed when you can't make those payments. Okay, so companies have the same possibility of happening. They go bankrupt, right? They put people out of jobs. They've invested a whole lot of money and then that money is basically wasted. A, sen a sensitivity analysis can upfront give you some guidance on whether this project is worthwhile. Now, what's the opposite of risk? What can you do to counteract risk? Insurance, okay. Insurance is the opposite of risk. So if you find a parameter that you're extremely sensitive to, let's say utility prices, okay? Here I've got utility prices in yellow that are fairly shallow. But let's imagine for a moment that utility prices, <coughs> let's say the cost of natural gas, for example, did something like this. So small changes in, that, in the price of natural gas lead to an unprofitable project. That's risk, 
What's the opposite of risk? It's insurance. What can you do when you're faced with high utility costs? Okay, buy a forward contract on the cost of natural gas. Lock in a price with a supplier. You go to the supplier and say, I'm going to buy natural gas from you, but I need you to guarantee the price for me for the next five years. You're willing to pay a little bit more, right? But you're basically giving yourself five years of breathing room where you know that that price is that price and not going to fluctuate and potentially push you to an unprofitable zone. Okay, so let's say you did this NPV analysis and this was for a period of N equals four. You want that price of that natural gas contract to be locked in for at least four years so that you can evaluate a little bit later on. But you want this certainty so that you don't want to move along the red curve. Now, of course, locking yourself into a natural gas contract means that if the price of natural gas drops, you won't see this benefit. Right? That's what, it, what the supplier of the contract, that becomes their risk and their reward is to get that benefit. But if the price of natural gas rises, you don't see this side either. Okay? So you've locked yourself in. It's no different to um, you going to your landlord now and negotiating a five-year lease and say, I'm going to stay here but I don't want to pay any rent increases over the next five years. Okay, most commercial leases, like if you're opening a restaurant or a business, most commercial leases are for five years. So that's, that's the norm. So it's the same idea. You lock yourself in, you're counteracting the risk with some form of a contract or an insurance policy. Okay? So we've looked at a sensitivity analysis and we've looked at spider plots. There's one other plot we'd like to take a look at, still in today's class. And that um, plot, what we've looked at here is often called a break-even analysis. Uh, for those of you that have taken business courses might have heard of break-even analyses. That's essentially what, what these plots are. They find the point where you break even or cross NPV equals zero. But I want to just uh, emphasize a little bit more about that. <clears throat> Let's just look at it in this context. I'm going to change my vertical axis to be a little bit different this time. This time my vertical axis, uh, the zero is over here. And my horizontal axis is going to be production rate. Now production rate in most engineering processes, that's like tons per day. Um, another way you can see production rate is sales. Assuming you can sell everything you produce, your production rate is um, essentially equivalent to sales. And there's no stockpiling. Okay, so if that's my production rate and it can go from a value of zero, so I'm producing nothing over here. At this point, I'm producing nothing and I'm also not making any money at that point. So this vertical axis is going to simply just be dollar figures and you'll see there's various dollars going to show up here. The first cost that we have is fixed costs. Now, Tyler spoke about fixed costs last week. Or and fixed costs are those costs that you pay no matter what. So whether you're producing zero tons per day or producing 100 tons per day, you're still paying these fixed costs. Okay, this would be insurance on your building, property taxes. The government doesn't care whether you're producing zero tons per day or 100 tons per day. You still have to pay your property taxes. So you add up all those costs. Those are your fixed costs. They do not vary with production rate. The next cost that shows up then are your variable costs. These are costs that vary in proportion to your production rate. And what I'm actually going to do is I'm not going to add it from the bottom of the axis. I'm going to start from this point on. And your green curve there represents your fixed plus variable costs. 
Okay, so I'm basically taking those fixed blue costs in blue and I'm adding to it my variable costs. Variable costs are the costs that scale in proportion to how much you produce. So if you produce a greater product, number of products, you have to have more employees. You have to spend more on electricity. Those costs scale sometimes linearly with the throughput or the production rate. And then the final price or cash flow I'd like to show in here is sales. So if you're producing zero product, you've got no sales. As you start producing product and you sell it, you might be making sales and you get a curve that looks something like that. So in red then is revenue or sales. Assuming in this example that everything you produce you're able to sell. Okay. So what a break-even analysis does, and uh, we can give this plot a title with that name, break-even analysis. is it essentially is interested in the point where that sales curve crosses the fixed plus variable costs curve. So we really are interested in that crossover there. That's the point I've bro broken even where my sales equals my fixed plus variable costs. Okay, and this gives the company a number to work with. They need to produce products at this rate or greater in order to be profitable. Because the region between the red curve and the green curve, so this region here is essentially their profit. So that region and beyond is where you're making your money. So there's uncertainties here as well. Uncertainties with respect to your fixed costs, uncertainties with respect to your variable costs. And so you'd, you'd look at several versions of this break-even analysis under different scenarios. Okay. But for this course and the course project, my focus is for you to develop a sensitivity plot similar to this one, a spider plot, where you find multiple parameters that are realistic Right? For example, you would not vary in that spider plot the MARR or the tax rate. Those numbers are not likely to change. But numbers around the utility prices, the selling prices, capital costs, some of these other parameters we've spoken about here, these are parameters that will change in chemical processes. Right? So investigating the sensitivity of your income, your NPV, to that is the critical part of this course. Okay. Now a lot goes into it. In order to get just this one number, just to get any single one of these points on the spider plot, you need that full NPV spreadsheet with all your capital costs. Right. So capital costs estimated for all your units in your process. You need the incomes for all your products that you're selling, expenses for all your raw materials, catalysts, and so forth. Costs of your labor, costs of all your utilities. So all those costs and incomes that Tyler had spoken about in, in one of the prior classes. He listed them and you developed a long page of those. Okay, so every single one of these points, there's a lot of complexity. Now, it's easy once you've got one point, obviously, to get all the others because you just change single cells in your spreadsheet. But setting up that spreadsheet the first time is, uh, takes some time. Any any questions on on this so far? Oh, absolutely. You can get an equation, but how are you going to convince your boss to invest in this project when there's all these equations, right? 
this is by far the most effective form to convince your, your manager. And I, I've seen these countless of times in a company to make a convincing argument to a manager why your project needs, needs the money. Right. So visual, visual analysis is by far the best way to go with some careful analysis in text below it. Now, the one thing that you must all be really asking yourself is, like, hang on here though, you've only investigated one parameter at a time. Right? What if two things change simultaneously? What if the selling price, I'm forced to sell at a lower price because a competitor sets up a plant right next door to me and starts selling the product at a bigger discount? Right? So I'm now forced to move my selling price lower, but at the same time, utilities go up. Right? The cost of natural gas is slowly starting to climb in our current economy. What happens if, in that situation if two things change or three things change? Right? So there's ways to visualize that. that um, and some students in prior years have, had written some simulation software to do a variety of scenarios with various probabilities. And that can lead to some really interesting analysis. So, so those of you that are in the, in the business area, you, you'd certainly know what, I, what I'm just talking about there. You can assign probabilities to these events and come up with a variety of scenarios to find the most probable outcomes. But some of the simplest ways to visualize two, two things changing simultaneously is as follows, I'll just, just illustrate it this way perhaps. So if we're looking at NPV again, and this parameter here might be sales price, it might be that my sales price has this sort of curve. So as sales price gets higher, I make a greater NPV. But what I can do is overlay on top of that curve. This is not the percentage. Notice this horizontal axis is the sales price itself. But what I can do is add a new line here that shows the sales price with a different cost of utilities. Okay. So the blue line might be for when utilities are $8 per gigajoule. Is the red line for the case of a utility that's cheaper or more expensive than $8. So the blue line is $8 per gigajoule for that utility. So this is cheaper. Right? So this would be $6, say, for example. And the yellow line might be $10 per gigajoule. Okay, so now you've got the case of two things changing simultaneously. Not only is your sales price changing from left to right, but you've got three different curves for a second parameter for utilities. Okay. So you would pick two parameters that are the most likely to change and visualize them in that way. Okay, so all the notes that were posted on the course website I've essentially covered, but just here in uh, this format on the board. So all of this is in the midterm as I had the notes up there earlier on. Wednesday's class, I will be here for questions, and then I'll see you in Wednesday evening.